All right, grab a Bible. Pulling out of our series for a minute on Story of God, because we're in the Christmas season. So we're going to lay into a few things for the next few weeks around Christmas, uh, obviously finishing on Christmas Eve. So this week, go to Luke, which is the third book of the New Testament. So if you find the New Testament, um, which ironically, even though it's the second of two, it's not the halfway point. It's towards the very back of the book, honestly. The majority of your Bible is the Old Testament. So uh, go to the New Testament. Third book is Luke. Um, as always, need a Bible. There'll be some stuff on the screens. Not everything will be up there. So it's important to me that you are looking at something and reading along out of your own copy. And what we're going to start into is the joy of angels. I've been uh, thinking about this this week and well, over the past few weeks, and uh, especially though through this week, and the, we're going to consider the, the, the moments when the angels came and made announcements to people. So we're going to start with Mary. We're going to look at Mary this week. And Mary and Joseph, who we'll look at next week, are going to overlap a little bit. So don't be surprised if there's, you know, well, why didn't we address this? this? Well, we'll get it next week, so don't worry. But the joy of angels. And as a pastor, and I know, uh, David, you can probably attest to this too, but as a pastor... Uh, Christmas messages can sometimes be the hardest uh, because they're so familiar. And you may feel like, well, if it's familiar, it should be easier. Well, if you're a learner, it's not because it means you've got to dig a little deeper maybe and resist the temptation to fall on what you know and allow the Lord to show you and teach you and lead you in something. So um, as I was looking at this, Josh and I had talked about it, came to a decision, hey, this is what we're going to do. And as I was looking through it and thinking about it, um, I was really moved by just considering the obvious event that was going on. I was really just thinking, you know, what must this obvious event, this moment, been like for all the people who were involved? And I'm kind of struck this year by the angels making this announcement and how they might have felt. To make the announcement. And I wondered if maybe instead of Gabriel appearing to Mary in this somber, shocking, whatever moment, maybe he showed up psyched. You know what I mean? Maybe he showed up like, I cannot wait to tell you what you are about to hear. I don't know. But I am going to believe that from now on. I think so. So we're going to look at it. Luke chapter 1, verse 30. Let me read here first. The angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary. This is Gabriel speaking. You'll see this in a moment. For you've found favor with God, and behold, you'll conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you'll call his name Jesus. He'll be great, and he'll be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. Lord, your word as always is your word. I don't get up and repeat this like a mantra. I get up and repeat it because of two things. One, I want to remind myself. And two, I want to yield to it publicly. It's your word. I don't, I don't ever want to put my word into your mouth. I want your word to speak into my heart, into my soul, into my mind, and come out of my mouth. Not just here, but everywhere. Thank you for entrusting all of us with it. Not just, I know I got a microphone and a privilege, but we're all holding the same book. Help us be faithful with it, Lord. And fill us with joy for what's in this book. I love you, Lord. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So I don't know if any of y'all watch the World Cup or have seen any of it this, this particular year. Uh, it's actually been a pretty good one. Some of them in the past have been really boring, to be quite honest with you. Um, they go exactly as predicted to some degree. This year, the world got shocked this weekend. I don't know if any of you saw this, but uh, Morocco yesterday became the first African team to make it to the semifinals. Think about that. The whole continent of Africa, all of those nations, none of them have ever made it to the semifinals until yesterday. Morocco did. Shocked the world. And it was awesome. The celebration was off the chart, man. And, and if you get a chance to see this online, you should look it up. The fans were going crazy. The team was going crazy. Uh, men were tackling each other, rolling around on the ground. They were racing. Oh, people were so overcome with joy. They were crying all over the place in the stands. The, the guys ran over in front of their uh, fan base, and they had their flags wrapped around them, and they're jumping up and down. And the, the fans are jumping up and down. They had their coach. They got their coach and not just put him on their shoulders. They were tossing him in the air. He looked like he was on 
flat on a trampoline, bouncing up and down. It was, it was awesome. They went over and knelt before their fans to say thank you. Um, it, it was just unreal, the level of... I mean, at one point, you even saw them all kissing each other on the bald head, sweat everywhere. I was like, wow, man, now you know you're happy. Uh, but I was thinking, I wonder if the angels felt like that at Christmas. You know, I wonder if the angels felt like that at Christmas. I, if it was this formal choir, or if they were unhinged. You know what I mean? I don't know. But I think it's worth thinking about, and that's what we're going to do. Why would they do that? Like, why would they be unhinged? Would they do that? Would angels be, I'm not talking about out of control crazy. I'm just talking about, would they be overcome with joy? Yeah, I think so. God said in Job 38, 7, that they shouted for joy when he laid the foundations of the earth. So therefore, they are obviously able to be full of joy. And for us, joy becomes this formal word. You know, but it's not a formal thing. You know, I'm not saying it makes you crazy, but it's, it's not a formal thing. It's a powerful thing that moves your emotions and you celebrate, and that's what I think they're doing. They celebrate God acting. They celebrate, they do. They, you can look in the text of all scripture. They celebrate God acting. They celebrate God displaying his power. They celebrate who he is. They celebrate his nature, how he loves, how he rescues, how he restores, how he fights uh, for his people, how he redeems all these things. But maybe the most awe-inspiring, I think, for angels and us is grace. Like, they are blown by grace, and the Bible says so. Uh, and if you're any kind of honest, you should be too. But that God would love man in such a way that he would determine a way to save them from being lost by entering their world as one of them. You know, as one of them. Subject to all the things that any human faces, but with a plan to restore what their first father, Adam, lost. Mind-blowing. Why would he do that? i got to believe the angels are like, what would you do that? Man, how can that kind of love exist? How can that kind of grace exist? And so I think they are full of joy about it and anxious to share it with whoever's going to be part of it. Which brings me to our one point, if there is a one point line in all this, and it's on the sheet, but I always give you something to walk with or think about. If the angels find joy in delivering the news of a Messiah, even when it means lives are going to be changed, then may it bring the same joy for us to do it. And I'm not saying you should have joy. That's not what I'm saying. I'm asking, God, please bring that same kind of joy into my life, into our lives to share it like they did. So over the next three weeks, we're going to look at the joy of angels to Mary, the joy of angels to Joseph, and then the joy of angels to the shepherds on Christmas Eve, which will be a little bit different. It'll be shorter and more, um, well, you'll see. But look at Luke 1, look at verse 26. So let's pick it up there. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city. So first of all, Gabriel didn't just go on a journey here. This is a mission of God through Gabriel to a city of Galilee, named Nazareth, to a virgin, betrothed to a man, whose name was Joseph, of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. That's a lot of specifics. This was very specific Mary. This was not just Mary, Mary Magdalene, Mary, this Mary, Mary, that Mary, Mary, the other Mary. This is a very, we don't have to guess who this is. Like, this is an extremely specific person in an extremely specific place. Won't go into all that. But it says, verse 28, And he came to her and he said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. Now, favored one, uh, and I hope I don't step on any toes today, but we're going to cross some, some bridges because they're here. So, favored one means that she received grace from God. Does that make her sinless? No. Does it make her holy? No. No, it means she received grace. What, do, what makes her favored here is really simple. He says it right there. Oh, favored one, the Lord is with you. So God's presence with her is what makes her favored. And of all women 
In all of history, she's the one that God's decided to use as the mother of Christ. So, so that, there's some importance to that. But why Mary then? And honestly, we don't know a whole lot about her. we got a lot of opinions. We've seen lots of movies and lots of drawings and lots of pictures and lots of whatever. We really don't know much. Tradition said she was a teenager, and that's likely, but it doesn't actually say that. Uh, it probably was. I believe she was, but it doesn't, to be fair, it doesn't say she was a teenager. Her response to this moment shows she was devoted to God. We're not going to go into all that. You can read it in your own time. But she knew the word pretty well. So they can tell you that she was, you know, a godly woman in that sense, or at least knew his word. But that's all that we know about her. You know, other than her bloodline, that's it. It's dangerous to start writing the book on how holy this person is. You know, there's a great, line, a great piece of, uh, this is commentary from uh, uh, believers, Christian believers, but from a Jewish background. They wrote this. They said, there was nothing intrinsically worthy about Mary that set her above other believers as if she was perfectly holy. The Greek word here for favored got translated into Latin as gratia plena, plena which means full of grace. Roman Catholicism developed from this the teaching that Mary's fullness of grace allows her to bestow grace onto others. This teaching is the basis for the familiar Roman Catholic prayer known as Ave Maria or Hail Mary. However, this is not the biblical view. Mary was a humble sinner, a truth that she herself acknowledges here when she says in verse 47, My spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior. Only a sinful person needs a Savior. So clearly, Mary was not sinless from her conception as Roman Catholicism teaches. Furthermore, 1 Timothy 2.5 states there's only one mediator between God and man, the man Jesus Christ. So Mary does not intercede for others, only Christ. When God called Mary to become the mother of the Messiah, he enabled her to take on this role. And his choice of Mary springs from his grace, not from any inherent merit that she possesses. God did not act because of her, but on behalf of her. I like that. Goes on one more thing. He says, the fact that God suddenly and without forewarning stepped into her life to bring her into his service utterly surprised her. If we're to look to her for anything, it's her response. I liked it. I liked it. I think there's some great truth. Look at verse 29. But she was greatly troubled or confused at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. Notice Mary's not sure how to interpret what's happening here. Maybe she's like, wait a minute, is this an angel or a prophet? I mean, he looked like a man. I don't know if he's glowing. It doesn't say all that. That's stuff that we put in there. Is, is, did he knock at the door? Or did he just appear in her home? That's the, we don't know. We don't know any of that. Did she run into him on the street? Don't know any of that. All right? But this person, she's kind of shook by, like, maybe she's thinking, is this an angel? Is this a prophet? There's something different about this person, clearly. But the tone, I think, is what makes her uncertain. The tone of the moment. I think, rather than this massive display of power and glowing, blinding light from above, that Gabriel is jacked. This is me. Like, so excited about what he's got to tell this woman. This is me now, just telling you. Uh, just as we can add in the light and the glory and all that other stuff, I can add in the joy and whatever. And I'll be honest and tell you that doesn't say that. But it doesn't say it's not there. And there's some sense of excitement about the proclamation that he's making. So I think to some degree, maybe he was full of joy about this, and maybe whatever's going on with his excitement and his joy, maybe it's a little confusing to her. Like, what kind of angel are you? You know, I, I, I'm not saying that. But I feel like maybe she's, like, overcome a little bit or a little confused by, like, what? Because I see what I said, what type of greeting this is. Something was unusual about the way it was being presented. Not the message. The way it was being presented. Like, almost like, this is odd. Um... Are you, you, you crazy? You know, what's up here? Uh, verse 30. The angel said to her, don't be afraid, or in our language, don't freak out. I'm not crazy. Mary, don't freak out. 
For you have found favor with God. And behold, you'll conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. Again, again, it's only because of Jesus that Mary is called favored. That, that, that's the only reason. The angel literally tells her so. Look at that. You have found favor. Why? What do you mean? Behold, you will bear a son. So it literally says it. You, you, your fate, you have found favor. Behold, what do you, you, know, what do you mean I found favor? You're going to bear a son. And she hasn't earned this moment because, listen, if she earned this moment, then it's her due. She worked for it. She's due this. Of course I'm going to have the son. Of course I'm going to have the Messiah. I'm, I'm perfect. I've been sinless from birth. Of course I'm going to have the Messiah. Go away, Gabriel. You don't have to tell me that. I earned that. Not what it, that's not what favor is. That's the opposite of favor. Favor is grace. Favor is saying, you didn't earn this, but I'm going to give it to you. Complete opposite. Look at verse 31. You shall call his name Jesus. He's going to be great. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord will give to him the throne of his father David. And he's going to reign over the house of Jacob forever. And his kingdom will be no end. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking the dude is like just so excited about this. Great. That's the Greek word megas. What do you think of when I say megas? Mega, right? Big, huge, intense, surprising, overwhelming almost. Those are the kind of words that go with that. Notice the angel doesn't qualify what makes him great, too. This is pretty cool. I was reading a little deeper into this. Uh, John the Baptist, if you look at it, anytime someone is mentioned as being great, like John the Baptist, just a few verses back from this, was mentioned as being great. But it says, great in the sight of the Lord. They're always qualified. Greatness is always qualified in proportion to the Lord or to God. You know what I mean? Jesus, though, is called great. Because he is. Like, there's no, quali- no qualifying it. Great. God is great, and anybody who serves God reflects God's greatness. But here, Jesus is himself great because he is God. I'll give you a couple of verses. You don't have to turn to them. Deuteronomy 10, verse 17. You can just note them. If you write in your Bible, scribble it right there. Deuteronomy 10, 17 The Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords. Look what it says. The great, the mighty, and awesome God who is not partial and takes no bribe. Psalm 145, 3, verse 3, or verse 3. Great is the Lord, greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. Great, great, great. And here is Jesus, your son, is going to be called that. Your son, like son of Mary, but also son of the God most high, both God and man. We'll come back to that in a second. King, he aligns him with kingship here. He's a direct descendant of David. You can look at that. There's lineages in Matthew and in Luke in the beginning of both. There's a reason for those lineages being there because they give the throne to him in a human sense. His bloodline gives him a right to the throne of David and the kingship of Israel. Um, He is the king also promised by God. Jeremiah 33, I could give you a bunch. I'm just giving you a few. But Jeremiah 33 verse 14 says this. uh, Behold, the days are coming. And this is several hundred years before Jesus' time. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will fulfill the promise I have made to the house of Israel and the house of Judah. In those days that time, I'll cause a righteous branch to spring up for David. And he, this righteous branch, he shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. Even the Jews recognize this as about the Messiah. Verse 16, in those days, Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will dwell securely. And this is the name by which it, the branch, will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. And verse 17, for thus says the Lord, David shall never lack a man to sit on the throne of the house of Israel. Never, never, never. Um, Some interpret that as uh, allegory, like, 
there's a king somewhere right now who is a direct descendant of David who is supposed to be on the throne of Israel. Some argue that the queen, king and queen of England were or are that lineage and that God moved them to England and away from Israel and all that stuff. That's not what he's talking about. In fact, we know it because later in Acts chapter 2, Luke records Peter preaching a sermon. And in Peter's sermon, he mentions there's no end to Jesus' rule because he is eternal. How is he eternal? Rose from the dead. We know he's eternal because he came from eternity. But however you feel like it, he rose from the dead. That's why there's always a king on the throne of Israel. There's always a king on David's throne because he can't die. He's he's already been killed and he got up. (laughs) You know? Like it... God will give him the throne, it says in the text. So he's going to be established by God, and it's the throne of his father David, earthly-wise. So you've got a, he's a king from God's own hand, and he's a king from man's own hand, or man's bloodline. Verse 34, Mary says to the angel, say what? You know, how will this be? Since I'm a virgin, clear By the way, that virgin here is what it is, and not just a young maiden, some say, uh, because she doesn't understand how it will happen, the mechanics of this whole thing, you know, being a virgin. And notice that Mary's not doubting here either. She qualified her question with a very logical one. Okay, I hear you. I trust you. But I'm a virgin, so how exactly is this supposed to work? Like, what's the, pl- what's the plan here? Like, not doubting the plan, just questioning the process. Like, how, okay, do I have a responsibility here? Maybe she's thinking about Abraham. You know, we talked about that. Is there some, is something, what's supposed to happen? Verse 35, the angel answered her, and it, it gives her an answer. Well, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called holy, the son of God. Second time that's mentioned. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. This would be John the Baptist. That's in another part of the text. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. So she was barren, but now she's six months pregnant. He's kind of saying your own family is an example. She's old and she's barren, but she's six months pregnant. But Mary's not barren. Mary's a virgin. It's a little bit different, I guess. So I I feel her pain on that one a little bit. Second reference to the Son of God here. Second time. The idea of God having a son has largely been connected to Israel. If you look in the Old Testament, there's a lot of references uh, where God is speaking to Israel, and he's kind of doing it as as if Israel was his son. So the idea that God has a son is in a lot of parts foreign to the Jewish people or to the Old Testament. There are some texts in there that say it. I'll give you a couple. Um, But not many. Psalm 2 verse 7. uh, You get actually all the way through verse 12, but I'll just read the beginning. It says, I'll tell the decree. The Lord said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. So he refers to this son. He's pointing at David, but there's more in that text that you realize it's more than just David. Proverbs 30, verse 4 says this. Solomon wrote, Who has ascended to heaven and come down? Who's gathered the wind into his fist? Who's wrapped the waters in a garment? Who's established all the ends of the earth? What's his name? And what's his son's name? Surely you know. So there's some references in there that that imply there's more to this than just Israel as a son. But Jesus asked the Jewish rulers the very question that we're talking about here uh, in Matthew 22, verse 42. You can just note it, but he says this. What do you think about the Christ? Christ means Messiah. Christ is the Greek word for Messiah. So what do you think about the Messiah? Whose son is he? That's an interesting question. Remember who's asking this now. This is Jesus asking him. And these are the experts. These are the ones that know the Old Testament. There was no New Testament because they're living it. The Old Testament, these are the guys who know all of it better than anybody. Most, most if not all, had 
either large sections or all of it fully memorized. So you're, you're talking about knowing it. And he's asking them, in your great wisdom and knowledge of the word of God, whose son is the Messiah? And they say, well, he's the son of David. Supposed to be a descendant of David. That's correct. But that's not the whole story. He says to him, okay, cool. Well, then how is it that David in the spirit calls him Lord saying, so David's saying, he's saying, you're, you're right, but David calls the Messiah Lord, which would never be okay for a son, for David the father to call the son that. David has hierarchy over the son, so that doesn't make any sense. So he's saying, so how is it that David calls him that? And he quotes scripture. He quotes scripture, verse 44. He says, Jesus quoting scripture says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my hand, until I put your enemies under your feet. If David calls him Lord, how is he his son? You see what Jesus, I love Jesus style, man. I love it. Like, he doesn't just directly say, no, it's me. He doesn't actually directly say, no, it's God. Although he does say those things at other times. Right here, he just confuses them. You know what I mean? And, and not, not, not in a bad way. He points them back to the word, and he's just honest. Go back and read this and explain what's meant here then. Yes, he's the son of David, but that can't be all. Whose son is he? He's more than that. Luke 8, verse 26. When this demon-possessed man comes and sees Jesus, he cried out, he fell down before him, and he said to the loud voice, What do you have to do with me, Jesus? These are the demons speaking. Son of the most high God, I beg you don't torment me. Same language, son of the most high God. John 3, 16, we all know this one. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. John 1, 14, one of the best ones. There's so many, but I'm just grabbing a few here. John 1, 14 says, and the word became, speaking, the word is Jesus. You can read the whole chapter, you'll see that. The word became flesh and, Jesus, and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. I mean, it's, John put it straight out in black and white. I'll tell you whose son he is. He's God's son, without a doubt. And, and we're not taking the time now, although we can talk about it as much as you want. And you can go back and actually, if you go back to the first sermon in that Story of God series, we talked about this a pretty good bit. It's not that God birthed God Jr., you know? It's, it's not what the Bible teaches. In fact, the Bible teaches the exact opposite. There's only one God. So it's better to understand not, not as God Jr. here, but as God the Son. He is God the Son. It's an aspect of God. Isaiah 9, 6. Memorize it. Park that one in your mind. That is the best, in my opinion, uh, one verse for the Trinity, you could call it, if we want to use that word. Um, it says this, for to us, and you know this because it's a Christmas verse, but for to us, a child is born, to us, a son is given. Great first point, the child was born, the son was given. The son already been there. The son's always been there. The son was given. And when the son was given to us, he was born as a child. All right, and then it says the government shall be upon his, this child's shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. Counselor is the word that we also associate with Holy Spirit. So you could plug that in there. He will also be called what? Mighty what? God. And then the next one, he'll also be called Eternal what? Father. The name of the Son is Eternal Father. So they're all in there. And then Prince of Peace. They're all, they're all in there. Is it, 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 can you get your head around this? Are you joking? You know? <laughs> no chance. Does that make it untrue? Why? Why would something I can't explain suddenly make it untrue? That's ridiculous. I can tell you a great truth. In the past few weeks, I've dealt with a clutch that would not operate. That's a truth. I know it. 
Uh, I, could I fix it? Not a chance. Do I know how it works? Not even a little chance. Could I describe what it looked like? If, I, if you parked it right there, a clutch right there, could I tell you the mechanism? No, I wouldn't even know that's where I'm looking at. Does that mean it didn't happen? No, of course it happened. Of course it's a problem. Just because I can't explain something means nothing, okay? Plenty of things that can't be explained, but that doesn't make them less true. So, in any event, Gabriel knows who this is. Gabriel knows what's going on. And, and I think Gabriel's mind is blown by this too. Not so much who God is, but that the son is going to be a child. Man. I, I, I'm totally making this up now. But, but, but I wonder sometimes if, if, if when Gabriel and the Lord, because they had to have this conversation. If Gabriel and the Lord, get, you know, maybe the Lord say, hey, can I talk to you a minute? I need you to do something for me. <laughs> Could you go tell Mary? <laughs> You know, I, I, the son, am going to be born in her. You know, angels aren't all-knowing. They're created beings, too. I imagine he's like, you want to run that by me one more time? You know? Uh, I don't know. But excited about it. Like, oh, man, once he's getting it, once he's seeing it, oh, man, please. Oh, I can't wait. Send me to her. I can't, I can't wait. Like, all the way back to Adam. Like, we've been waiting since Adam for this day. Man, I can't wait. Let me go tell her. And then verse 37, in response to uh, her confusion on how it's going to work and whatever, he says, for nothing will be impossible with God. Great verse that Jesus referenced in Mark 10, 27. When the disciples were asking, how can anybody be saved? Jesus said, with man, it, salvation, is impossible, but not with God. For with God, all things are possible. Verse 38, back in Luke chapter 1, Mary says, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word, and the angel departed for it. Now, don't ignore her response here. This is a big deal. Understand, if she's betrothed to a guy, uh, that means that this person has invited her into a marriage contract. They're married. It's done. From day one, they're done. But it takes it up to a year, sometimes longer than a year, for that marriage to be ready. Like their betroth- betrothal is not like us with where you give the ring back if you're not happy anymore. Uh, it's not like um, an engagement. Like, oh, we'll be engaged for a period of time. There's a process. A betrothal was a process. Like from the moment that I ask you and you say yes, you know there's going to be at least a year here as I prepare for it. But during that year, we're already married. It's already done. To end it at any point in that year is a divorce. Is a divorce. So for for her, for her to say, "Be it done to me as you say," is acknowledging the fact that she's about to get pregnant while being betrothed, and it ain't going to be her husband's kid. Uh, and that's according to the law, reason for being stoned. She should be stoned for that. So by accepting that, she's accepting, in essence, a death sentence. Now, maybe she doesn't realize it in the hype and the joy of the moment, but that's what she's saying. And, and, and if, though, her man-to-be got her pregnant during the betrothal period, maybe they couldn't wait, maybe, you know, all that, whatever, and got her pregnant during the betrothal period, at the very least, they would be ostracized from the community and put out of the community, uh, and she could still be subject to more shame than him. But besides all that, by saying, be it done to me as you said, what is her husband going to think? Is she going to lose him? Like, is she going to lose him? Like, he didn't promise her anything on that, right? He didn't say a word about that. I mean, is what's going to happen? Would she lose her husband because she chooses to honor God? Would that happen? We'll look at that next week. But... She's accepting all of these ramifications as she's trusting that if God sent him, then there's a plan. And God will work his plan out. However he does, he'll work his plan out. Man, it's an awesome, awesome, awesome text. And I sit here and I think about it in light of Christmas, which is what we're doing. You know, God was born. Like, that's just such a wild thing to think about. I know we talk about it all the, while, but all the time, but, but he was born. But it was born as a gift, you know. 
He was born as a gift. He was born to fulfill millennia of prayers. Think about that gift in that moment. Like you, y'all ought to know because we've been going through this story of God all the way back, man. All of this time, all of history, creation in general points straight to this moment, to this moment, this gift of salvation, forgiveness of sin. You know, and maybe, maybe you, you're like I used to be, and you feel like forgiveness is impossible. Like you have no idea what I've done. You have no idea what I thought yesterday. You have no idea the crud that pops in my mind. Like forgiveness is, is impossible. Yes, it is impossible with you. But with God, all things are possible. Forgiveness is not only possible, it is paid for and available for free as a gift. Man, that ought to make you happy. You know what I mean? That ought to make you full of joy. Uh, it, If you realize it's a gift you need, if you realize it's a gift you need, it ought to make you full of joy. Can you admit you're in need of that? Like, I know I'm a sinner. I know who I am. I need that. I need that gift. Can you can you tell him, look, I I trust you are who you say you are. I trust what you've done is good enough. I'm not good enough, but you are. I trust it. I want you to have my life. Can you say that? If you can, say it. You don't need me to have you give you a moment because this is your moment. Just say it. But I do want to come shout with you. I won't throw you in the air like the football team did, but I might hug you, you know. It's a, thing, it's a reason for joy, right? It's a reason for joy. Let's do one more song. Y'all can stand with me, and uh, I'll pray here in just a second. But, but I'm thinking as I circle back on this, um, If it is a reason for joy, and I think it is, if the angels found great joy in the opportunity to tell people about it, man, shouldn't we? Like, shouldn't we have that same kind of joy if they had joy in their hearts to tell people? Salvation's come. Like, he did what he promised. If they had great joy in their hearts to do that, shouldn't we? Especially this time of year, y'all, because it's so much easier right now because people are already looking for it, wondering what it's all about. You know what I mean? So let's, all, let's do that. Let's all ask God to fill us with joy to want to tell people. It, it, if for no other reason, because we want that feeling of joy when we do. You know what I mean? Let me pray. Lord, thank you again for your word. Thank you for the opportunity to be able to share the same message. The same message. I'm just, I'm reading it right out of your word. Uh, I will never get my head around how you were born of a virgin. I, 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 mean, I know we'll talk about that next week, but, but at the same time, Lord, I just... My mind is blown by that. But when I stop and I step back and I think that you, you spoke the sun into existence, uh, nothing is impossible with you. And what blows my mind further, much like the angels, Lord, is that you love me. You love every person standing in this room to a degree that I, I can't even understand But it does fill me with joy. And I pray, God, today that we all leave excited about the fact that our God loves us. Lord, I love you back. And I offer these things as praise to you in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.